Hello, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 10th in our series of webinars focused on EU careers. Um, previous webinars have looked at uh, various uh, jobs competitions and opportunities with the European Union institutions, including around EU traineeships, Irish language opportunities, opportunities in the field of agriculture, opportunities in health and food and safety, interpretation and translation, data protection, and anti-fraud, amongst others. Our webinars can be watched back at any time on the Department of Foreign Affairs YouTube account. Last Thursday, the EU launched a competition for administrators in the field of maritime affairs and fisheries with a deadline of 11 January. And today's webinar will provide more information on this specific competition. The Department of Foreign Affairs provides support to Irish citizens applying for jobs in the EU at every step of the process, including access to online practice packs for computer-based tests and one-to-one -one training, depending on the competition stage. Please do contact us if you are applying for EU posts at eujobs at dfa.ie. Now I would like to welcome our speakers today. Uh, Owen Mucky joins us from the Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, DG Mare, where he is currently a policy officer. Our second speaker will be Colm O'Sullivan, who is our fisheries attaché in the permanent representation of Ireland to the EU in Brussels. And we're also going to be joined today by Maria Serfiotti from the European Personnel Selection Office. Maria will give us an overview of this specific competition process. And I want to thank all our speakers today for giving us their time. I also want to thank you for joining us online today. You will have a chance to ask your own questions using the Slido platform by going to the webpage sli.do and using the code hashtag EUjobs to access the system. You don't have to register, anyone can do it. Before I hand over to Owen, uh, we'd like to play today a short message from the Minister for European Affairs, Thomas Byrne, which highlights a very important strategy that the government is currently implementing. Uh, and the title of the video is A Career for EU Strategy. So we're going to roll that video now for you. Since Ireland joined the European Union nearly 50 years ago, Irish people have been working at the heart of the European Union, shaping policy making and acting as a bridge between our national system and the Union's institutions. In May this year, I was very proud to launch the government's new strategy, A Career for You. This strategy aims to ensure that Ireland continues to have the right people in the right places with the right skills and languages, delivering for the European Union for the years to come. Today, I am encouraging anyone with an interest in a rewarding and exciting career with the European Union in Merle no Ingeilge to explore the many options and pathways available to you. And we are here to give you every support and help we can with the recruitment process, whether through practice packs, supports for interview preparation or our information sessions on recruitment campaigns, all of which can be accessed through our website. So visit our EU Jobs website Connect with us on our EU job social media and keep an eye out for job opportunities and campaigns. Berbua agus gormaghaibh. So maybe uh, with that, it's a good time to kick off today's uh, proceedings, and I'll ask our first speaker, Owen Mukri, to take the floor. Owen. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. So I think. Uh, I work in, in maritime affairs and fisheries in DG Mara, so I think a, a good place to start would be just to give an overview of uh, what DG Mara is and, and what kind of work we do. Uh, it's a very small DG. Uh, we've got five directorates. There's about four units in each directorate, but that makes about 300, 350 people. And the main topics, uh, so I'll step through what each directorate does. Um, directorate A works on maritime policy and blue economy. So you've got things like innovation, research, marine knowledge, mapping, that kind of thing. There's also aquaculture, offshore energy, maritime spatial planning, and there's a unit of economic analysis in there as well. Uh, Director B then is international work. So you've uh, a lot of lawyers and things working on ocean governance, 
uh, international laws of the sea, uh, RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations and partnerships, trade negotiations, WTO as well. And then uh, Directorate C deals with the North Sea and the Atlantic. So fisheries management, common fisheries policy, conservation policy. Uh, there's also a unit that deals with structural support. So that would be the EMFF, the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, and its successor, which has just been launched, the MFAF, European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund. Um, there's also a unit in there that deals with scientific advice. So you'd have uh, scientists, marine biologists, that kind of thing, working on data collection for fisheries as well. Um, and there's also a unit there that deals with Brexit. Uh, Directorate D, which is where I am, is fisheries management in the Mediterranean, uh, Black Sea and a couple of other areas. Uh, structural support as well. Uh, so the MFAF and the EMFF, which I mentioned, there's a unit for that. Um, my unit that I work in is the overall coordination of the CFP and the funds, the EMFF and the MFAF. Uh, there's also a unit on fisheries control and inspection uh, enforcement. Uh, there's several Irish people in that unit, actually. And then there's Directorate E, which is all the machinery that's required to run the DG. So um, budget, IT, HR, legal, and so on. So that's the structure of the DG. Um, I can honestly say that there's a huge, huge variety in, in the, the work that's involved. Um, I've been working in Mara for eight years, and over those eight years, I've been working on environmental files, files with DG Sante. So um, I was working on aquaculture for a little while. So uh, things to do with uh, animal health and, uh, you know, agriculture food standards. Uh, also, then I worked on, on the funds, so I was working with Rejo and employment, all the structural support, um, there would be links with Agri as well, with the CAP, uh, trade files as well, um, then other profiles that we would have in the DG, we'd have a lot of economists, lawyers, uh, people that are involved in the, in the international unit do a lot of travel as well, um, so if that kind of thing is what you're into, there's plenty of opportunities. Um, day to day work really depends on, on what you do. Um, but I can tell you from my own experience that I'm constantly talking to stakeholders in the parliament, in the council, um, maybe in fisheries organizations, producer organizations. Um, we'd be getting expert input for reports, which would then be used to update legislation. Uh, so you've got the whole process that you go through to update the legislation, dealing with uh, linguistic things, dealing with lawyers, correcting the language, uh, consulting with member states, consulting with various, uh, you know, open, open, what do you call it, uh, public consultation. Um, and then you'd have meetings with the member states. So in, in the case of Ireland, it would be meetings with colleagues in BIM or in Clonakilty. Um, you'd have high level events where you're trying to get ministers involved and commissioners and uh, dealing with evaluations, tenders, people carrying out studies uh, on contract. It's a really, it's a huge mix of tasks. Um, I can tell you a little bit about my own background, how I, how I ended up there uh, or how I ended up here, I should say. Um, I studied a, a degree in computer science and geography. And after that, I did a, a PhD in uh, computer science, focusing on GIS. So that was my sort of entry point because I was able to, to deal with mapping and visualization and so on. And uh, then I followed a, a postdoc uh, in the Joint Research Center in Italy. So I, I, had, I didn't really want to stay in academia and I thought, okay, let's try and give something a try that my research can be used to, you know, help develop policy or, or be used in some kind of positive way. I felt it was really in a very small little box doing my research before that. So that really opened my eyes to, to all the, the application of science to policy in the many different fields, uh, health, environment, fisheries. I happen to be working in fisheries. And at that stage, I tried a couple of different concours. I think it was on my third uh, competition that I was successful. Um, it was a 
specialist competition like this one. Not for, I wasn't a fishery specialist at that stage, but it was a GIS specialist competition. And after that, then I came to DG Mara and I've worked in three or four different jobs uh, since then in Mara. Um, let me see, if there's, if there's any advice that I could give, it would be that it's possible for anyone. There is a huge variety of, of uh, jobs, backgrounds. It takes all kinds of people. And from my experience in uh, doing the competitions myself and then subsequently helping other colleagues to have a go at them, um, it just takes practice, 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 practice. You have to practice all the different kinds of um, tests that you've got to do. And, and then when you're answering the questions, just make sure that you answer. It's just like doing an exam and you're leaving CERT or you're in university. Answer all the questions, make sure you cover all the criteria. And I, I think that's the, the, the most straightforward advice anyone can give. Thanks, Simone. Uh, that's a really helpful uh, way, I think, to kick us off today. Uh, you know, a quick look at the structures of DJ Mary, a little bit of a reflection on the variety of the work involved. But I think, uh, above all, uh, interesting to get your own uh, route into the EU institutions, what took you there. And then I think you've, you've already anticipated, uh, uh, which is great, some, some of what we may talk about later on, which is, you know, practical advice. And a couple of things uh, struck me there that, uh, you know, first of all, many candidates uh, don't do it the first time, the vast majority, I imagine. So you need to, you need to work at this. And I think secondly, uh, you know, it, it, the, the fact that it, once you do apply yourself uh, in a particular way, systematically, you will get there. Uh, and I think that's an encouragement for those who might be watching us today. Uh, and maybe a good moment then to, to move to our second speaker, uh, who is uh, my colleague here at the Irish Permanent Representation. Uh, I should have said at the outset, I'm the director for uh, Parliament and Institutions, uh, and Colm is our, 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 our next speaker, is our fisheries attaché. And Colm, I'll hand it over to you uh, to talk us through maybe a little bit of uh, some of the kind of key policy interests and, and some other angles I know you want to explore. Thanks, Colm. Sure. Thanks, Eamon. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, and just just to follow on from from what Owen was saying. I think he, he gave a very good description of of, of how complex uh, DG Mary is and and the sheer range of of um, matters it deals with. Um, unlike Owen, I've never actually worked in DG Mary, but I have been dealing with uh, colleagues in in Mary uh, for nearly fifteen years now. Um, and the one thing I can say, I've, I've always been hugely impressed by by the quality of, of people they have there. Um, it's it's a high standard. Um, I'd, I'd say that from the outset. Uh, what Owen was, was was probably too polite to say is the the sheer pressure of work that that the colleagues in, in DG Mare are are, uh, are put under, the standards they're expected to achieve. Um, it's it's a very pressurized environment. Or it certainly can be. Um, I, I would expect that many people on on this webinar are. are, are are reasonably familiar with it. Um, we've just come out of the annual December Fisheries Council and uh, in, in our usual uh, drama queen way we managed to go all night yet again. Uh, we actually broke our own record and went to five past nine uh, yesterday morning so I'm, I'm, I personally am still a little bit groggy from all of that. Um, I suppose from, from, from an Irish point of view people often ask me like why, why does Ireland have a fisheries attaché? You know, is it, it's, it's economically quite small um, and I suppose the, 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 the answer is always, uh, in overall terms, yes it is, but uh, if you're a small coastal community and that's the primary source of economic activity in the area, then it, it becomes extremely important. Um, my own focus is, is primarily on fisheries policy. Um, that can go from kind of high political um, positioning on, on Brexit down to detailed negotiations on technical measures, <clears throat> on, on, on quota shares, on, on, on control regulation, on uh, financial regulations. Uh, Owen mentioned the, the MFAF, we've been negotiating that for the last um, three, four years, finally it was concluded earlier this year. Uh, we've been discussing the control regulation for, for three years, that's still not finished and probably some way to go. Um, but it, 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 it is a highly complex area. Um, for, for, for Ireland, um, 
and, and I think this is true in most countries with the fishing industry, uh, fisheries definitely punches way above its, uh, its economic weight politically. Um, all you have to do is look at the attention it got during the Brexit negotiations. Uh, from the very start, it, it was kind of one of the key drivers, Nigel Farage bringing his, his, his flotilla up to Thames. Uh, right up to present day, when you you will see lots of media commentary about the uh, the issue of licences for EU vessels, French vessels in particular, in, in UK waters under the TCA. In a way, that that's a kind of a perfect example of of the kind of work that goes on in DG Mary, and that at one level it's it's ostensibly kind of technical work and uh, and and quite detailed, quite complex technical work in terms of um, what kind of vessels are qualified or or, or may be qualified to uh, it's it's extremely uh, sensitive politically and, and right up to prime ministerial or presidential level so it's 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 a good example of how fisheries um, can can go from uh, uh, very niche and very technical to very high level uh, 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 politics in in the blink of an eye uh, and then we go we, we come back down again and um, fisheries people are, are, are generally uh, we don't overestimate our, our importance in the scheme of things, um, but uh, we, we we do tend to land in the limelight from time to time. Um, I, I would strongly encourage anybody with an interest in it. I think DJ Mar is an excellent place, but I think the fisheries world in, in general, um, like I said, I've, I've been doing it for 15 years, and I can honestly say I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed all of it. It's, it's, it's extremely challenging, extremely complex, uh, and a vast variety of tasks. Um, and I think I'll mention it that you know there are there are people with all kinds of backgrounds working in Mare, um, lawyers, economists, historians, uh, you name it. You'll find somebody with, uh, with 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 different qualifications in in there. And I think that that adds to the um, to the whole policy making process. Um, so you know, from from a department point of view, and I'm I'm here in the rep uh, seconded from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, uh, uh, normally based in Clonakilty, dealing with uh, fisheries policy. Um, but it's uh, I think from from an Irish point of view, we have quite a number of Irish colleagues in 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 DG Mara. Uh, we would certainly like to have more. Um, you know, it's it, from a government perspective, it's it's extremely uh, important. To have people with an understanding of the issues that face coastal communities in Ireland, uh, in the heart of the policy-making machine that is DJ Mara. Um, again, most of the people on this call, I'm sure, would be aware, but um, fisheries is an exclusive competence of, of of the EU. Therefore, the Commission has um, full responsibility for all negotiations with third parties, and which obviously now includes the UK, um, but also obviously has uh, a exclusive right of of, of initiative, so all proposals for any changes will, will come from the Commission. A big one coming down the tracks, and uh, Owen and I know will be involved in this, is, um, is the 10-year revision of the Common Fisheries Policy. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a big one coming down, down the road, but it's, uh, again, any possible changes in that would be of huge interest and huge importance to Ireland. Um, and Brexit is, 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 is the huge gift that keeps on giving the, the, the complexities of it, the challenges of it um, that are not going to go away and if anything are, are, are becoming more complex by the day as we try and kind of figure out this new world. So the more people in, in Mare who have a direct or, you know, or, or at least an indirect knowledge of how important this, you know, all of this is that while, as I say, not on the face of it massively economically important in the bigger scheme of things, it is hugely important to a large number of very small communities where the economic alternatives uh, may be slight. And I implore any of you who, who, who do apply for this job uh, or these, these, these posts, uh, if you're successful, to, to bear that in mind. Uh, it, 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 the work you will be doing does have a, a direct and a real impact on new people. Um, I'll leave it at that. Happy to help anybody, uh, any, any questions, either during this or, or offline. Uh, I'm, I'm always available. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Colm. Uh, really helpful again. Um, I suppose, first of all, thanks for sticking with your commitment to be with us, not, notwithstanding the travails of the last few days. Um, and I, I, in a way, I suppose it does underline the high politics of fisheries and, and where it connects with, with the real world, as you say. 
Uh, and I think you, you know, the fact that you, 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 you were able to elaborate in such a clear way on the importance of fisheries to, to Ireland, but also beyond, as well as I think that that's sort of last piece that you were covering in respect of uh, the importance of the EU institutions having um, people who understand where, where, where Ireland comes from. Obviously, they work for the European Union, but they have a country they know best, as they say. And it, it, is, it is vital, particularly with the Brexit background, that the Commission continues to have access to human resources who have that kind of understanding. So I think really helpful to, to situate us uh, in, in, in that frame. And I think probably uh, leads us nicely to our next uh, speaker. Uh, who is Maria Sofiotti. Uh, Maria has joined us uh, for a number of these webinars over the past year. I'm very grateful to her for being there because what she brings to the table is a very clear understanding of the competitions, the concours, the nuts and bolts of uh, how you apply uh, and uh, what's involved in, in, in a competition. And obviously, this webinar is framed against a very particular competition uh, that um, is, is uh, about to get under full swing. And, and um, I, I want to hand over to you, Maria, maybe to talk us through that, which I think would be a great practical assistance to candidates as well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. I'm happy to um, talk to you about uh, the selection procedure that we have organized and the steps that you have to go through if you would like to apply uh, for this competition. I'm just going to share, I have a um, short presentation uh, just to walk you through. Um, I hope you can all see it. Um, so. Uh, what we're looking, we're looking for 86 actually successful candidates. And as we said, it's going, they're going to be in the reserve list uh, for uh, the DG Mare, as we call it, the Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. Um, what will be the duties? Well, it depends um, in which uh, directory you will be recruited as a successful candidate, uh, what um, Owen said. Uh, but mainly we're looking um, for experts that will uh, contribute to the policy development and implementation in the common fisheries policy, in ocean governance, including law of the sea, as well as maritime policies, uh, including mar uh, marine environment, but also on land. Um, you can find uh, there's a long list uh, in the um, notice of the competition. I will provide you also the link later on. Um, it's the legal document where you can find all the information about the competition. And there in the Annex 1, there is a long list of around uh, 14, I think, um, uh, potential and possible uh, duties that you will have. Uh, so uh, I will invite you to, to look at those in detail. Um, what are the general conditions in order to be eligible for the competition? Well, first of all, and the most importantly, you need to have uh, full rights as a citizen of a member state of the European Union. Uh, you need to have met any um, uh, military and, um, obligations that are in in your country and also uh, to meet the character requirements of being an EU official. This is a general rule for appropriate behavior and ethical standards. Um, what are the specific conditions? So um, for this specific competition, in order to be eligible, you need to have completed any university, um, university studies of um, at least four years uh, attested by a diploma. And then you need to have three years of professional experience uh, related to the duties of the specific competition. However, if you have completed any university, uh, university studies that are of three years, then you need to have four years of a professional experience again in the duties related to this um, competition. So you see, there is no specific degree required in order to be eligible for this competition. Uh, however, um, university diplomas that are focused, for example, on biology or fishery science or on oceanology, if I pronounce correct, um, will count because it will count on the talent screener when the selection board will um, will look into that. I will tell you about that in a minute. Um, so this will be taken on board. Um, later on in the procedure. 
Uh, what else is required? A thorough knowledge of at least two EU languages. I will also uh, look at those in detail uh, right now. So when you apply for the competition, you will have to select your language number one, as we call them, language one, and must be one of the um, 24 official EU languages. And you will have to have a minimum, minimum low knowledge of C1 level, according to the common uh, European framework of uh, reference for languages. Uh, also, when you apply, you will have to select your language number two, as we call it. And, and that is also that has to be also one of the 24 EU languages. And very importantly, this has to be different from language number one. As uh, you understand. And it's actually, um, this is the first time uh, that we at EPSO um, having, we are having a competition where the language number two can be selected from all the EU languages and not just from the uh, three working languages of the um, EU institutions. Uh, so the second language has to be at minimum level B2. Um, and I will uh, see how these languages will be used throughout the process. So what is the procedure? First of all, you need to apply online in our website. You have to create an EPSA account. If you uh, already have an EPSA account in our website, then you don't have to create another one because only one account is um, um, needed uh, per um, candidate. And uh, you would also be asked to fill in the talent screener, as we call it, as part of your application. Um, here, the application and the talent screener will be filled in, you will have to fill them in in your language number one. So the main language will you be doing are the, this application and the talent screener. And what is the talent screener? The talent screener is, is important because it's, it's there are questions that you will have to answer. All candidates will have to answer the same questions that will be reviewed afterwards by the selection board. Um, and that will be um, required in order for the selection board to do uh, the first assessment uh, and that information that you provide there in order um, and will uh, give grades and uh, marks and, and then those that have the highest marks will be um, uh, will uh, be invited to go on stage uh, number one. It is important to know and a little tip because the the talent screener, although it is part of the application procedure, uh, you might have to repeat information that is somewhere else in the application, uh, also in the talent screener. And the reason for that is because the talent screener is being reviewed by the selection board, while the application is being reviewed by us at EPSO in order to check your eligibility criteria. So um, uh, do duplicate, let's say, the information in order to make sure that you have put all the information, even if it's um, uh, twice, let's say, in, uh, please make sure that you have uh, uh, put everything in in detail. Um, so then we have the stage number one, which includes a reasoning tests, so verbal, abstract, and numerical tests. And then we have um, those that have the pass marks. Uh, they will be invited to stage number two, which is the assessment center, as we call it. We will see in detail the various steps. And um, following that, and if you have uh, the pass marks or the highest marks uh, from the uh, stage number two, then you will be at the reserve list of the successful candidates. Very important also to know, being in the reserve list doesn't necessarily mean recruitment, uh, because then you will still be invited for interviews by DG Mare, uh, probably in order to see if you uh, fit uh, then their needs. Um, so let's see them a bit in detail. So I said the first stage after you have had the highest, um, the passing marks from the talent screener, um, you will be invited for computer-based multi-choice uh, uh, questions. These will take place in language number one and it will be verbal, numerical and abstract. These tests uh, could take place either online or in person at the EPSOS accredited centers. You will get information about that um, once you um, have succeeded and closer to uh, the, the, the dates in order to uh, make the necessary arrangements. And for those um, reasoning tests, um, there is a, you must have obtained at least the pass mark. So, um, so you just need a pass mark, and those marks actually will not uh, count towards your final overall mark. 
So you just need to get the, let's say, the, 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 the pass marks in order to get to stage number two, uh, which is the assessment center. And what we're doing in the assessment center is um, uh, we are assessing eight general competencies, as you see on this slide. And we also assess the field, um, the, the field related competencies of the candidates. How we do that? Um, so as you see, depending on the on the um, competencies, uh, they will be uh, tested by a case study, which will take place in language number two. And also, um, they will be tested by a computer-based interview in also, also in language number two. And lastly, there will be uh, the field-related interview in order to test your uh, field-related competencies. It's important to know that the assessment centers, so all these three tests, they will take place remotely. So they will be online. Um, you need to have, a, uh, you have to obtain uh, the pass mark um, in order to be, uh, to, uh, be um, selected, let's say, and uh, you, the selection board will draw uh, the list, uh, would only include the names of those eligible candidates who have obtained the pass marks as well as the highest overall marks from this, um, uh, for the assessment center. Now, how you can apply? This is the link that takes you straight to our website. Uh, you will find detailed information about the procedure, about the competition. As I said, there is the notice of the competition. This is the most important document. It includes very important information about the selection criteria from the, uh, that, the, that the selection board will use in order to assess you at the talent screener. Uh, you will also find the detailed list of the um, uh, of the duties that you will have as a successful candidate. You will also find all the pass marks, the scores that you need to get. So it's very, very detailed and it's very important to read it very thoroughly. I also include a link uh, for instruction in order to do your online application if it's the first time. Uh, also on our website, we have sample tests. These are generic efforts. We don't have specifically for the um, uh, maritime affairs and fisheries uh, field, uh, but you can get an idea of what to expect. And also the anchors to assess the competencies that we discuss for the assessment center. Deadline, as already mentioned, is the 11th of January. And I've also including here the rules and rights for the EU civil servants as we are, um, that also reflect the salaries and what to expect. Um, that's all for me, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the procedure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, again, uh, as with previous webinars, really, really uh, of assistance to get the nuts and bolts of what you need to do to apply and, uh, you know, the process that needs to be followed. And I, I think one point you always try to bring across is the importance of reading the, uh, the notice of competition, the application forms, etc., very closely. Um, we uh, promised at the outset there would be an opportunity for Q&A. I, I mentioned to you all about Slido, sli.do, uh, and enter the code EU jobs, and you can pose your own questions, and quite a number of people have already been doing so. Let me um, distribute a few of these just to get us going. Uh, can I just begin maybe with a question uh, for you, Owen? It's, a, uh, it, it's maybe one that, that uh, uh, you know, is put, is put in a, a kind of quite a creative way, and I, I think it'd be interesting to get your take on it. And the question is, if there was one key uh, thing that you wish you knew before starting your time in DG Mary, what would it be? <laughs> How brilliant it was going to be. <laughs> it's really a fantastic place to work. Um, I, I just, I can't stress that enough. There's so much variety and it, you're forever working with colleagues in different DGs and different countries, different languages. Uh, while Maria was speaking there, I was just thinking of my own use of languages in the job. Um, okay, it's an important criteria for the, for the, for the, you know, to get past the competition. But then in, in daily, you know, daily tasks, you come across so many different languages, like I get documents in French or in Italian, or it can be any language. And once you're in an environment where you're listening to different languages and you see things in different languages all the time, you become much more familiar with it and it, 
you, you're able to pick things out and, and it, I, it, I can't even really describe it, but uh, it, it's a very, very dynamic, very quick moving environment with lots and lots of input from all different, all around Europe, colleagues from coming from everywhere with different perspectives. And as you mentioned, Eamon, at the start, it, it, it's good for, for Ireland to have colleagues where they're familiar with the, uh, with Ireland when they're when they're dealing in policy terms. Um, you see colleagues thinking, you know, Polish colleagues thinking in Polish terms, Romanian colleagues thinking in Romanian terms. It's a very, very interesting environment to work in. Thanks, so, um, um, and there's maybe kind of a, 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 another question which um, I was addressed to Colin, but I think is probably more for you. So I'll, get, I'll mention it to you first, and Colin, if you want to you come in on this, please do. But maybe we'll start with you, Owen, and just the question that we, we've been asked to put to you is, what, what would you say to someone who might not have the technical knowledge on sea fisheries policy, but who'd love to pursue a potential career in DG Marit? Um, well, if we're looking at this specific competition, I mean, the first thing is, do you meet the criteria to the eligibility criteria? So if, if the question is, I don't meet the eligibility criteria for this competition, but I'd still like to apply, there are other routes. Uh, there's general competitions. Um, there's also several other types of contract, contract agents. You can apply via caste system. I think uh, Maria is probably a much better uh, person to, to answer the different options to get in. But uh, it, it's not limited at all. But um, this competition is really looking to find people that have that expertise, that background um, to fill these very specific roles. Um, and as Maria was speaking, actually, one thing that struck me that the difference between the general concours and this expert uh, or specific uh, concours the fact that you only have to achieve the pass mark in the in the three reasoning tests makes a big difference because in the general concours, uh, your objective is to be ranked as highly as you can, and then they they select the the top ranking. Whereas here, you achieve the the pass, but because you have the expertise, you get into the next round. Thanks, Owen. No, that's that's really helpful. I think the last point is is particularly pertinent. Um, somebody else is asking, uh, 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 and again, Colin, feel free to jump in. Um, are, are there any resources or, that you would recommend using to prepare, best prepare for the exams, the interviews? There's plenty of resources available. Uh, it's a while now. It's gone back nearly 10 years since I sat the competition, so I'm sure there have been uh, new versions coming out or new updates since then, but there are several, several different uh, companies that prepare, you know, example, uh, numerical abstract and verbal reasoning. And then for the situational interviews, all of those things, they give you example questions and the kind of situations you can expect. There's plenty of resources. I think Maria might, might have some links on that already, perhaps. Uh, yes, indeed. There are a lot of uh, companies online that they do that. Um, as you said uh, on the beginning is practice, practice, practice. Um, however, this competition does have the advantage that you only need the pass scores and also your marks doesn't count on your overall um, score. So that's quite an advantage for the specific competition. Um, yes, you can also learn our website so you can have. I think we lost Maria. Um, yeah, we lost. We and lost also, Maria. oh, sorry. Maria, you might just, yeah. uh, Maria, you might just recap that last piece there as we, as we had a slight technical problem. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we have you now, Maria. Could, could you maybe recap your last answer uh, as we lost you a little bit in the middle of it? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, we do have um, in our website sample tests. Those were not specific on this competition, unfortunately. But I would also recommend that you read thoroughly the notice of the competition, because there you would see what the selection board will also actually be looking at. Um, and that is quite important because they will be um, what they really are interested. So you will get a hint 
of what they will be looking also probably at the interviews for the field related um, in the assessment center. Okay, a few more technical questions coming in here. Um, does a PhD also count as work experience? And if yes, how many years? Uh, well, according to the notice, it doesn't count as working experience. It doesn't seem to, um, um, but um, you should put all the information there. I know um, it says, the, the notice says that you will have to, indicate um, when you apply on your professional experience the exact amount of time that you have spent uh, per task. And um, so there is, um, it doesn't seem to me that uh, what I've read of the, of the notice that it counts, but everything is a plus yeah? because uh, then you can add it in the talent screener probably with the questions you can mention there. And then the selection board uh, gives, um, you know, weight on specific issues. So, um, so I think it will be uh, on your um, advantage. Maybe just from my perspective, I mentioned that I sat a GIS specialist course and that I had a PhD in computer science and geography. So in my case, I was working, that did count as work experience because I was doing a lot of GIS analysis. So in this case, maybe if your PhD is in marine biology or you know, some kind of fishery science, then that's really, that is going to count. It is true, actually, that in the, sorry, I'm going back to this, that in the selection criteria for the talent screener, um, the selection board also includes, uh, let's say it says professional experience, but also includes scientific research. So that could also fall in. So don't be disheartened and include it. And, um, and it's up to the selection board to decide um, if it it's counts or not. Maybe just a final thing I mentioned earlier about really addressing the questions that are asked. It's that's the critical point in the talent screener to make sure that you illustrate that you have all of the necessary experience. Don't leave it, don't leave them guess because when they're put yourself in the shoes of the person that's assessing it, they need to say, Does he fill this criteria? Tick, tick, tick. So show that you meet all of those criteria. That's really essential. I've looked at a lot of people's um, applications prior, you know, draft submissions. Um, in the last couple of years and several times I said yeah but you didn't answer that that key piece of information that they're looking for so really make sure you, you sell yourself well in the talent screener. Yeah no, that's really helpful both of you I think this is this is the kind of the very focused advice that that, that you'll be of assistance and perhaps just to, to take up another couple of issues um, one is maybe framed a little bit generally, but interesting to hear from, from any of you on this, but I guess Maria in particular, from your experience, what is the biggest stumbling block in candidates not getting hired? And it may be just what we were talking about, or, or it may be other things. Um, and then also, how often do job opportunities arise for DJ Mar DG Marin? Perhaps you could take us through those, Maria. Uh, well, uh, it all starts with the application and, and you need to, um, let's say, you have to uh, pay um, attention and, and, and uh, do it properly and do it not doing it in a rush. So, you know, start with the application and the talent screener, um, save it as draft, go back to it, don't leave it for the last minute. As uh, Owen said, you know, uh, don't, um, you have to really put all that information in what you have done. Uh, so. Um, don't rush it um, and also practice, as Owen already said, uh, practice, it's important, even in this competition that only is a pass marks, but it will, um, it would be, it would be good to, um, to, to do so. And, um, and uh, that, that I would say about that. Now, if um, about the Digimare, um, this is quite, um, a specialized competition so it's, it really focuses on we need uh, experts on on maritime affairs and fisheries uh, and expertise uh, however if you are looking for something more general and you don't have that expertise there are other possibilities there are the contract possibilities uh, that we uh, have in our website that could be project management maybe or um, depending what background you have but for specific this field i think this is a unique opportunity and um 
And even if you're hesitant about, do I have the professional experience? Does it count? Does it not? Well, read the notes of the competition in detail. The annex is very, very detailed about what we're looking for. And also, if you still hesitate, do apply. Uh, because then it's up to the selection board to decide actually, okay, yes, that could be that could be uh, of an asset for Digimare uh, to have that in. And so if you're not sure, still apply. And um, then it's up to the hands of the selection board to, to see if your experience does count. Because we don't know when the next one is going to be, uh, because this is quite big, 86 candidates, 86 laureates. So the next one <laughs> might take a while. <laughs> Sure, no, that, 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 that's fine. And um, actually, maybe a question that kind of flows from that. Um, is there a breakdown of the 83 posts by grade? Well, I mean, I guess the grade is the same for all of them, but maybe what, what the questioner is getting at is uh, the areas in which they will find themselves. Anything on either of those uh, possible interpretations there? Well, about the the grade is a standard, so it's an 86. So no matter if you have more experience, let's say for the three years or the four years that are required, they won't count extra, let's say. So that gives you um, um, an advantage on the grade and, and, and on the salary subsequently. So that won't, um, unfortunately, that doesn't play any role on this. The grade is standard and that is also uh, connected to the uh, degree. Now about the... The areas, um, so we're looking for mainly common fisheries policy and the um, marine time environment. Uh, you will find all the details in the notice and that's the idea I have. I don't know if Owen has more specific um, information about that from inside Digimar. What was the oh, second yeah. part of the question again, please, Eamon? Um, that rang a bell with me uh, with, about grades and well, I, I guess, um, you know, I, I was interpreting the question as also maybe meaning where would people end up working? Uh, yeah, work. OK, so of the 86, where are they likely to end up? Um, I'm not sure that has been defined. I think when when the competition was being defined, it was we, we did a survey throughout Mara. OK, what kind of expertise do you need? This is the opportunity to make a list based on the expertise that you need. And then when the, when the positions come up, the, the candidates will be taken from that list as needs to be. But uh, no, it's not, I highly doubt it's predefined. Thanks, no, that, 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 that's great. Um, two questions that are kind of related to one another and we'll take one or two more. We are beginning to, to draw to, to an end, but let me just ask these two. They're a little bit related to one another. The first is, uh, can, and I think, Marie, you've already possibly, you have answered this, I think, but can those with a, a comms degree, a communication background apply for this competition? And then the second one, uh, which uh, again is, is uh, aimed at you, Maria, it's um, you mentioned that the nature of the candidate's degrees will count in the talent screener. Is there a list of degrees to choose from of what happens if your degree isn't recognized, for example, marine social science? Uh, yes, so in, to reply to the first question, if you have a communication degree, you can apply as long as you have professional experience on the field that we are looking at. So if you have a communication degree, but you have worked on um, um, uh, fisheries policy in Ireland or uh, maritime, then then you can apply because uh, the competition does not exclude any university degree. Um, and that also applies for the uh, degrees that count, let's say for the, town, the, the talent screener. We indicate just a, an idea of potential degrees that could count. So that doesn't exclude others. Uh, I mentioned osteology, I mentioned, um, uh, what was the other one, sorry. Um, the, uh, yeah, biology and fisheries and uh, that, that is just an indication that doesn't mean anything. It's up to the selection board to see how this your your degree uh, relates to the um, to the specific uh, competition. Okay, Maria, there's a couple more for you, and I think we'll make these the last two because uh, I think there are some uh, there are some remnants of the system, and I, I don't think we, we should test fate too too much. Um, the 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 second last question. Uh, which I think is a pretty straightforward one. Is there an age limit for candidates? I think the answer is no there. 
Uh, and then the, the last question perhaps um, is, could you maybe comment on the pay scales available and the typical after-tax pay that someone could expect to achieve if successful? I'm sorry, I mean, I didn't get the second part of the question. Do you mind repeating it, please? Yeah, it's just asking uh, what, what is the typical after-tax pay that someone could expect to achieve if they were successful? Oh, okay. Um, so for the first question, yes, there's no limit, age limit um, uh, for the competition. Um, that's for a start. And then regarding the uh, salary. So um, that depends, the salary in general depends on your personal situation. The base salary for 86 is around 5,600. And then it depends your um, your family situation. For example, if you're married, if you have kids, uh, then there are allowances that come up, uh, and and um, it's diff and that is also calculated with the tax uh, because it depends on the overall um, uh, total that you have, and then the tax is being uh, directly um, um, withhold in the EU if, within the EU. You can find online. I know there are um, there is an Excel, there is a form online that you can calculate actually depending on your personal situation because that varies, as I said, it varies uh, the total amount that you would have um, on the on your personal situation. So do a bit of research online. There are forms and they're, they're very well, uh, they're very close to the reality. So have a look and then um, it depends on the individual. So I cannot really give an, a, a number on that. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's, that's really helpful. Um, and I think we'll stop there in terms of questions. Uh, look, we've had some, I think, uh, great interventions, um, clearly an awful lot of interest out there. If we didn't get to any of your questions, um, you know, feel free to contact us. Uh, we, we, the details are, 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 are uh, as, as I gave them at the outset. Um, I think our three presentations, you know, own giving us the kind of lived experience of working in DG Murray, uh, Colin, in a sense, pointing out, you know, for, for Ireland, why this is important. Uh, and then Maria giving the nuts and bolts. Um, I think they, you know, they, they gave us a very good uh, comprehensive uh, outlook on this particular competition. Um, I hope you found it as useful as we intended it to be. Uh, I hope it's also offered you encouragement. Uh, uh, and that you will, you know, think seriously about applying uh, for these posts. Again, to stress the Department of Foreign Affairs is willing and able to assist people who apply for EU jobs. Um, there is support available from us, so please do get in touch with us at eujobs at dfa.ie if you are thinking of applying for these posts. If you want to re-watch some of this webinar or share it with someone you know, it will be available on our DFA YouTube account shortly. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at EU Jobs Ireland to keep up to date with all our upcoming events and various opportunities in the EU. And just before closing out uh, today, I want to thank again our speakers, and I want to thank uh, in particular uh, my, my own team uh, here at the Permanent Representation, Mike Williams and Maria Sternitivo. Uh, Maria has been with us uh, for many of these webinars and leaves us uh, shortly. Uh, to go on to, to, to other things and um, just to acknowledge the contributions she's made to this series um, uh, today and of all days. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, good luck with the upcoming holidays and good luck with the applications. All the best. Bye-bye.